And I pray, Father, also for those who cannot be seated and be in comfort. They're standing and their limbs are aching. We would ask that you'd specially bless them. Make it easy for them now, just for a few moments as the message goes forth. Speak to our lips and listen to our ears, Lord, and may thy great name be honored. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> This week I have come to you not able to speak but just a little bit because I hardly have had a night off since Christmas, constantly speaking. And we started off at Chicago where the Lord gave us such a wonderful service. And it was in a blizzard, and every city that we have visited since then has been in a blizzard. And I told Dr. Vail, which is just one of my new associates, I was going to call him Blizzard Vail for now. <laughs> well, every meeting we've had, they've had a blizzard. In the Chicago meeting, we're still getting great testimony. Just one that I would like to mention just now. Billy was giving out prayer cards one night, and there's been a little woman little typical Swedish woman, and she was very poorly dressed, and she said, Honey, would you give me a prayer card? He said, Mother, I just give the last card out and I'm leaving. said, However, tomorrow night you meet me here, I'll give you a prayer card. She said, Bless your heart. Honey, that'll be all right. So she goes in, must have climbed up into the second or third balcony, while the Holy Spirit was on in the building that night, anointing, it went up into the top of the balcony. It said the little lady sitting up there, which was the same lady. She is praying for her husband, who is a dispatcher on the railroad, and is deaf in one ear. He's just received the hearing. She looked at her watch. And when she got home that night, her husband is standing in the door with his arms out screaming. He had got his hearing just at that moment. Oh, it was saw by vision. A colored lady sitting in a distance. The Holy Spirit moved to her and told her that she was from adjoining city and that she was suffering with the diabetes and pronounced her healed. And said, also your sister, a heavy set woman, is in Arkansas in an insane institution, 10 years an inmate, maniac, butting her head against the wall. And the lady witnessed that was true. And it said, but thus saith the Lord, she just now come to herself. And at that very same hour, the woman came to herself the next morning. She was dismissed with a medical discharge that she was perfectly normal, called her sister and greeted her on the phone, and the following night, the woman with her testimony, the way she was described, standing at the platform giving praise to Almighty God. Hallelujah. He still lives. Glory. A man for his friend standing on the platform up in Wyoming, who was paralyzed in his back for a number of years, told him his friend would be healed within the next 12 hours. And at the end of the twelve hours, the man raised from his wheelchair and walked and come to the, got on a train and come to the meeting and testified to the glory of God. Oh, aren't we happy tonight yes. to know that Christianity is not a bluff. It's something that is real. God is so real. I want to read just one verse out of his Bible. And that's found in St. Mark, the 11th chapter, and the 22nd verse. Just speak to you a few moments. And may God give us the context. And Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. It's been said in the scriptures that Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And being that we were going to have a faith line tonight, 
I thought it would be appropriate to speak just a little on faith. Now, many people think that uh, doesn't know just how to take a hold of faith. Jesus had been speaking to his disciples, and he said to them, have faith in God. But before he had done this, he had performed a miracle to show them that God still operated, that he still lived. He had said to a tree the day before, no man eateth from thee from henceforth for a season. And the next day, Peter noticed the tree had begun to wither from the roots. He was showing that just what it meant. And Jesus made it not a raised voice, but just with real faith, said, No man eateth from thee. And the tree began to wither. The light went out of the tree. Now, before he would teach his disciples what he did, he must show them first who he was. And that's the way he still does. As I have said before, when an occasion arises that needs to be God called on the scene, and the way God acts on that occasion, if the same occasion would ever rise again, God has to act in the same way that he did first. Or if he did not, he did wrong when he acted the first time. Oh, it seems to be such a hard thing for people to comprehend what faith is. Now, many people think that faith is just something like uh, a rub or a touch of totem pole or a certain mental emotion. That isn't faith. Many times that's exciting. Sometimes it's hope. I've heard many people say Oh, I've got all faith. But them, them standing in a prayer line, if they had that type of faith, they would not need have be in the prayer line. See, it's just the, an emotional faith. Now what? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, if I was starving to death, and... You came to my rescue, and I said, if I had one loaf of bread, it would spare my life. And you'd say, Brother Bam, I'll fix that for you, and would give me 25 cents. Well, 25 cents is the purchase power of the loaf of bread. Now, yet I do not have the loaf of bread. But I have the purchasing power of the loaf of bread. Now you people here that's real sick. I want you to listen closely. Now that 25 cents is your faith. Your faith is the purchasing power of your healing. Now if I had 25 cents, I could not eat the 25 cents. The 25 cents is not the bread, but it is the power that will purchase the bread. Now, when you receive faith, faith is the purchasing power of your healing. Now, like this, if you give me the 25 cents and maybe the grocery store was five miles away, but I can rejoice just as much with the 25 cents in my hand as I could with the loaf of bread in my hand. Because I have in my possession the purchasing power of the bread. Now listen, friend. When you receive faith, if you really believe it, you're just as good as he right then, though you might not be able to move. Amen. Now, it's not something that you imagine. It's not something that you work up to. It's something that you possess. 
You had it. I could show you my 25 cents. That is the purchasing power of the faith. And when you've got the faith, you prove it by the way you act. Amen. Amen. Now, I might have to go a long ways before I get the bread. But I can rejoice all the way and get more hungrier and weaker all the time. But yet rejoicing all the time because I've got the purchase power of the bread. Amen. There's a young man sitting here in a wheelchair. God only knows the man. As far as I know, his friends know him, his people know him. Here's another man sitting in a wheelchair. A lady laying in a cot. A man sitting here with crutches, holding, supporting himself. If those people could only receive faith, then that faith, if they could even move one bit better, then they could, when they come in here, there could be not 10,000 doctors tell them that they wasn't going to be well. See, it's something you have, you possess it. And now, using experience accompanies faith. And that's the reason that usually it takes a person that's acquainted with Christ as the forgiveness of their sins to know that he has forgiven you, you have an experience when you are born again that Christ forgave you and you know it. Therefore, with that experience, it's easy then for you to believe God for anything that he promised. Now notice, it's not always a dream man. Here, let's take some examples, for instance. Israel had been called out in battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines, just as, um, as it would be today, they had a great challenger named Goliath. Oh, he was a mighty man. His fingers were 14 inches long. And his spear was the size of a weaver's needle, probably from here to the wall. And he made a proposition with this. He, that's the way the enemy will do it. If he can see he's got the upper hand, he'll always proposition with you. But when he's in the corner, he's a coward. For the devil is defeated. He's nothing but a blood. If this Bible is the truth, which it is, Christ stripped him of every legal authority he had at Calvary. He paid the full price for sin and all of its attributes. But now this Philistine come out. He said, let's not have a great bloodshed. Let's not have any troubles. Let's just you choose you a man. And we'll choose us a man, and that's me. And let us come out here and fight. If I whoop your man, then you all serve us. If he whoops me, then we'll serve you. Sure. Who would tackle that great big giant? If there was any man in the whole Israelitic army that was then physically able, would have been Saul. Yeah. Saul was the king. And the Bible said that he was head and shoulders above any man in his army. Not only that, but he was a well-trained man. He knew all the military maneuvers. He had been schooled since a boy of know how to handle a spear or a sword. But he was afraid because the giant had his blood. But you know, God's always got somebody that's not scared. Hallelujah. Way back on the backside of the desert, hurt this pappy sheep, was a little old ruddy stooped shouldered boy that knows something about God. Hallelujah. 
He was a trained fighter. But when he heard that giant make that expression, he said, Do you mean to tell me that you'll stand here and let that uncircumcised Philistine defile the armies of the living God? If you all are scared, let me go fight him. Hallelujah. The most unequipped man there was in the group. And many times, when the devil has our people bound under superstition, that divine healing is some kind of a totem pole or something that was back in an age gone by. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the pitiful part, some of the best trained scholars we have is afraid to tackle the job. Some of our bishops and great scholarly men. Because the only thing they know is the Word. They've never had a real experience with God. Oh, come on now. And David knew what he was talking about. He wasn't so well trained, but he knew who he had trusted. All right. That's what's the matter today. Is man who is scholarly, great denominations behind them, but they're afraid to take that stand. Sometimes God has to get down and get some little ignorant, illiterate bunch of preachers that hardly know their ABCs to stand for what they know to be the truth Amen. for the experience. Amen. 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 No matter how well you're trained, if you're not experienced, no. right. you wouldn't want a doctor to operate on you that never had the experience of his first patient. Certainly not. We need. Christians who's got experience, who knows how to trust God. And David, when he went up, they brought him before Saul. And Saul said, well, you couldn't fight that man. Why, you're nothing but a little ruddy kid. And said, you're just a youth, and he's a warrior from his youth. He said, but Saul... There's just one thing you don't know. <laughs> I've had an experience. <laughs> Woo. Back on the back side of the desert one day, I was brought to a showdown. Glory. A lion running and got one of my sheep. I knocked him down with a sling shot. He rose up against me and I killed him. And a bear got a kid. And I killed him. And the God that delivered me out of the paws of the lion and the bear will deliver me out of the fear of that uncircumcised man. He knew what he was talking about. He didn't have much training, but he knew the God of heaven. He didn't need any training. You don't need it if you know God. And he conquered the Philistine because God was with him. What well, he had an experience. Therefore, he had faith because he knew what God had done, God could do again. And the crisis was on. And God would act. Oh, don't you see it? God obligated to act every time he stopped you in order to be God. If you just won't doubt him, he must act in order to save God. Amen. See, we get smarter. The generations makes us smarter. We learn the intelligence of our fathers. But God was infant to begin with. He don't get any smarter. What he did the first time, he has to do every time. Because he was perfect to begin with, and his actions, and his motives, and his power, and all that he was, was perfect to start with. Amen. Amen. You don't need any schooling. Now, notice again. It was Moses that had been down in Egypt and had all the scholarship, and was taught. 
and all the wisdom of the Egyptians, which seemingly was far above our wisdom today. And he was taught in all of it that he could teach their teachers. If there ever was a man that was qualified by education, it was Moses. He was a military man. He knew all the ways to fight and all the answers. But he went at it wrong and he failed God. But one day back on the back side of the desert, the only thing he knew about God was what his mama had taught him. That's the letter. That's his education. But one day on the back side of the desert, he was hurting his father-in-law's sheep. Oh, and he met oh, God yeah. in a burning bush. Oh, a supernatural. <laughs> and in five minutes, in the presence of that supernatural being, he was better equipped than all the wisdom that Egypt could have given. Five minutes before, he was a running coward. But after that experience of being in the presence and knowing that the God of the Hebrews lived, he acted different from then on. Let's look at it. Here he is, an old man, 80 years old. Whiskers hanging down to his waistline. And the next morning, we find him on the road down to Egypt where he's wanted for murder. Going down to Egypt to take over. Could you imagine this sight? Just look what faith does. And it looks like it's the most radical thing. And God sometimes does things that seem silly to the human mind. But by faith, Moses, a seen the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Amen. Look at this scene. An old man, 80 years old. His wife sat and straddle of a mule with a young man on each hip. Old Moses a hitting his stick on the ground, going along praising God. Uh, Where are you going, Moses? Going down to Egypt to take over. Uh, <laughs> going down to take over. A one man invasion. Uh, and the beauty part, he did it. Wow! He had faith in the God that he had experience with. God who made the difference. He didn't need his military training. He didn't need his scholarships. He needed an experience. And the burning bush had what Moses lacked. That's the same thing tonight with the church. The Holy Ghost has got what the church lacks. That's a burning, everlasting faith. Amen. Certainly, it was wonderful to see how God could do those things. He turned it over and he made a different thing because of God did it. Certainly it does. 
to be delivered. Oh, how needful it is. In the days of our Lord, before he left the earth, and Acts 1 and 8, he said, Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem, until you are due with power from on high. I misquoted the scripture, that's Luke 24, 49. Acts 1 and 8 says, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Yeah. And let's notice, there was a bunch of little cowardly people, 120 in an upper room, and they had the doors locked because they were afraid of the threats of the Jews. And then all of a sudden, there came a sound from heaven. Amen. Like as a rushing mighty wind. Amen. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. <laughs> oh, they were afraid a few minutes before that. But here they were all out into the streets. Magnifying and glorifying God. They had an experience that has set them afire that converted the whole world in that day. They had an experience. That's what we need. Experience accompanies faith. Of course, when Philip had met the Lord Jesus and had seen him tell Peter, or his name was Simon, and told him who he was, and told him what his name was, and told him what his father's name he was. It was after Philip had seen that done that he could encourage Nathaniel that he found on his knees a praying. It was after Nathaniel had come in the presence of Jesus. And when he did, Jesus said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. He said, Rabbi, when did you know me? He said, before Philip calls you, I saw you when you were under the tree. It was after that experience that he could fall at his feet and say, Thou art the Son of God, Thou art the King of Israel. It was after he seen the moving and working of the Holy Ghost in that man, and he knew that was the sign of the Messiah. It was after... A little woman who probably in her heart known she had done wrong and known she was of ill fame living with sick husbands. That she went out one day to a, a well at Samaria and on the road up no doubt that she was thinking about concentrating. That's why we miss God so much. We're thinking about other things in the sin of Him. Amen. Think on Him. And as she was going up thinking about it, oh, I'm so sorry that I have ruined my life. But some glorious day, the great Messiah will come. And when He comes, He will straighten us out and while she went up there, she seen just an ordinary man sitting over against the wall. And the man was a Jew. And he said to her, woman, bring me a drink. She said, it's not customary for you Jews to ask Samaritans such. We have no dealings. He said, if you knew who you were talking to, yeah. oh, in this church tonight, if you only knew that the real Christ, the Holy Spirit, is on earth today, just the same as it was in any day gone by, that is still the same. If you could only let it get into you. If you knew who it was that talked to you, you would ask me for a drink. And the conversation went on. The little woman, just as innocent of knowing who he was, after a while when our Lord contacted her spirit, he said to her, Go get your husband and come here. 
She said, I don't have any husband. He said, that's right. You have five. And the one you're now living with is not your husband. Look what happened. Quickly. She turned. And she said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. We know when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. But who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks with you. It was after that experience that she could run through the streets saying, Come see a man who told me everything that I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? After she had the experience, there was a little woman who believed in her heart that that was the Messiah. And she slipped through a crowd one day with a blood issue. And she touched his garment. For she said within her heart, if I can just touch his garment, I'll be made well. Just touch his garment. Notice. And she touched his garment. And she went away. And our Lord said, who touched me? And they all rebuked him and said what Peter did and said, the whole crowds are touching him. Jesus looked around until he found where she was standing. And he said to her, what she had, the blood is you. It was gone from her, for her faith had made her whole. It was after that she had that experience that she knew that the touch of his garment would make her whole. You know, the Bible said many touched his garments from then on. They went into the places trying to find how they could do it. Touch his garment. It was after Jesus had cursed the tree and the disciples seen his power when he turned and said to them, Not if I say, but Billy, I say unto you, If you say to this mountain, Be ye raised up and thrown into the sea, and don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you have said shall come to pass, you can have what you say. See what it is? Believe in your heart that that's coming to pass what you said, and you can have what you say. The astonishing thing today is the behavior, the spiritual behavior of the Christian church. How can we have faith? How can we trust God when one wants to be above the other? When one wants to be a ruler over the other? One more wants to be a little greater than the other. Have a little bigger campaign than the other. Preach it. How? Jesus said, how can you have faith when you seek honor one from another? How can you have faith when you're trying your best to pull your strength to be the state presbyter or the bishop or some kind of an overseer? Look out now. Oh, the conduct of the church is terrible. And trying to keep people away from the real thing of God. Amen. Hallelujah. It's after we have an experience with God. Then we become conducted as Christians, as brethren, as men and women who know God. Some time ago, way in the Southland, they used to buy slaves and they would sell these people for to have this like a used car lot. It was in the days of the slavery. And they would then take those slaves and sell them. And, and brokers would come by and they would buy so many slaves and take them over here and make a little money out of them and, and so forth. And that's the way they made their living, by selling slaves. And there was a broker came by a certain plantation one day. And he said to this man, he had a great bunch of slaves. So he said, I would like to look your slaves over. He said, very well. You may do it. And he watched all the slaves to see. He said, I'll take this one and that one and this one at a certain price. And the slaves, of course, they were away from their homeland. They would never go back again. They had been brought over by the Boers and had been sold to the southern people for slaves. They were away from Papa and Mama. They were away from sweetheart. They were away from wife. They were away from their babies. They would never go home again. They had to remain a slave until they fell into the dust of the earth, gone. They were sad. They had to whip them to make them work. They didn't have no courage. Just sluggish, we would call it. And they'd have to make them work. 
But they noticed one certain young man. They didn't have to whip him. He had his shoulders back, his head up. He was right at the moment. They didn't have to scold him. He was a real worker. So the, the buyer of the slaves, he said, I'd like to buy that slave. He said, he's not for sale. He said, well, I notice he's so much different from the rest of them. His character and his conduct seems to be so much different. He said, what makes the difference in him? Is he a boss over the rest of them? He said, no, he's just a slave. Well, I said, maybe you feed him a little better than you do the rest of them. He said, no, he eats out in the galley with the rest of the slaves. Well, I said, then tell me, what makes him so much different than the rest of the slaves? He said, I was only of him. said, I wondered myself for a long time. But finally, I found out. He said, you know what makes him different? I found out that overseas... His father is the king of the tribe. And though he's an alien away from his people, yet he knows he's a king's son. And he conducts himself like a king's son. Oh, brother, if we're living in the end time where atheism and formalism and all kinds of things is in the world and we're in a world of slavery and darkness. The Christian church should conduct itself like real genuine born again sons and daughters of God. We should have that characteristic about us. For our Father is the King of glory. And we are His subject. Though we in a sinful world, he is the King of glory. Let us bow our heads just a moment. Blessed Lord, oh, we see the shadows falling, the hour swiftly approaching. Yonder in Russia tonight is a bunch of missiles hanging. Only just one drink of vodka. And we would go into powder. And it's in the hands of sinful man. And you said in the Bible, as it was in the days of Noah and Lot, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. My God. They were eating, marrying, building, drinking, giving and marrying, building houses, marrying wives. And a very day like this, and we see the shadows hanging out of it. It's going to happen before morning. Just one touch of a trigger and we would be no more. And it would not not in any way take the scriptures out of order. And then if that is so close, yet we know that before the rain could ever fall, Noah went in the ark. And before far ever fell in Sodom, Lot went out. And if the end time is so close to destruction, how close is the coming of the Son of God for His church? How should we conduct ourselves, Lord? As sorrowful, educated, scholarly, or should we be men and women of faith? But the attributes of our Father, O oh, eternal God, you said in your scriptures that when the Son of Man shall reveal himself from heaven in the last day, I truly believe that you're now revealing yourself from heaven to the church in mercy and peace. And the next time you reveal yourself, will be in judgment upon those who is rejected. God, may we tonight take our stand, our position in Christ. They are like men and women of God, sons and daughters of the Creator, who just spoke and the world came into existence.
existence. God, we call ourselves Christians and can't even believe for a little healing. What you promised to give us. God, forgive us of our stupidity. May we rise tonight like real men and women, sons and daughters of God, and go forth in the earth conducting ourselves in like manner. While we have our heads bowed just a moment, I just wonder if there's one in here tonight would raise up your hands to God and say this, God, I haven't been conducting my life like a son or a daughter of God. Oh, I've been so curious and so slowful about things, and I, I, I want you to forgive me for it. I'm going to put up my hand to you tonight and say, God, if you'll forgive me, and then from tonight on, I, by your grace, I'm going to conduct myself like a real believer. God bless you. God bless you. That's right. All over the building. Is there a sinner in here now with your heads bowed? Everyone would raise your hand to God and say, God, be merciful to me. I don't want to die in this shape. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Yes, that's right. You, you, and you, you. God bless you, sir. That's right. Back there, you, you, you. Oh, my. Everywhere, sinners. Oh, that's right. We have a room for to bring you up around the altar, but God will hear you right where you are. What's happened? Jesus said, no man can come to me except my Father draws him first. Then God the Father is here drawing sinners to him, knocking at the door. All that comes to me, I will give them everlasting life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. Some other raise your hand and say, God, be merciful to me just now. I now will believe on the Lord Jesus, and from this night on, I'll conduct myself as a real son or daughter of God. Someone that hasn't raised your hand, sit out the vestibule. I see you way out in there. Yes, sir. All God bless you, my brethren. Back in this way. All around. That's right. God be merciful to you. That's right over there, sir. God sees you. And maybe some lukewarm church member now. That's never really, you know. You, you've tried to accept your healing, maybe. And today you say, yes, I got it. Tomorrow I lost that you don't lose nothing. You can do more lose than Christ can lose. If you really believe it, it stays there. Right. Nothing can take it from your heart. Mm. See, I haven't conducted myself, Brother Branham. I slipped a little old jokes. I stayed home on Wednesday night and locked, watched television instead of going to church. I've been wrong, but I'm believing right now. And from tonight on, I'm going to conduct myself as a real believer. Would you raise your hands and be merciful to me, God? Don't be ashamed. If you're ashamed of God now, God will be ashamed of you. God bless you. That's right. All over the building. Wonderful. Now let's bow our heads for prayer. Each one now in your own way. Heavenly Father, trusting only in thy merits. Oh God, I pray for every sinner that raised his or her hand. And may this very moment they realize that it was a spirit of God who caused them to raise their hand. They cannot raise their hand if some kind of a spirit didn't make them raise their hand. As we have said before, gravitation holds our hands down. Then we defy the laws of gravitation by raising our hands because there is a spirit within us telling us that we're wrong and we raise our hands towards our Creator. And ask for mercy. I just got one more day to be with you people here. But I want to say this. I'm sorry that I've been hoarse. But this is one of the finest group of Christian faith that I have ever met in this United States. God bless you, my brethren, who has taught these people thus. God be merciful to you and grant that you'll grow in the grace of God. You don't know how thankful you should be just as soon as the Holy Spirit begins to move in the supernatural form, each one of you believed in it. You mark my words. Weeks after I'm gone from here, you'll find out that people that was in chairs will be walking. People that were sick will come to their pastor and say, that just left me. I haven't been able, I've told my co-workers, 
Each night, I've never been able to catch the people so many. It was just one great blast of pain. I've never seen such in America. It puts in the mind to be across the sea. Somewhere. Oh, you don't know what a heritage you have. Protect this. Protect it. Don't never let any fanaticism or any group into this. God granted. Keep yourself virgin, unspotted from the things of the world. Stay right before God, loving with all your heart. Now tonight we have given out that we are going to have what we call the faith line. And that is to pray for those who have their prayer cards by passing them through the line, laying hands on them without the vision. Now we realize that, that tomorrow now we're going right back to the other line. Now it's very strange my ministry in America doesn't have the taste to it to the people as it does in other lands. The American people, now I'm not talking about this group, but the American people are intellectuals. See, that's the reason I heard this famous preacher, Billy Graham, which I believe to be a man of God. And I heard him say at his Louisville breakfast over there one morning, he said, this is the standard. When Paul went in and had a conversion, he went back a year later and had 30 off of that one. That I can go in and maybe I might not give the numbers just right, but say at 20,000 conversions and go back and two months and not find 20. See, oh, how I wanted to say something. But I was just a little fellow sitting back there. Here's what it is. See, it's an intellectual conception of Christ. The intellectuals is all right. But brethren, you will never know Christ until the Spirit of God has come down beyond the intellectuals. And it's an experience of being born again. That's the reason people can't believe in the supernatural and call it devils. It's because it's only an intellectual conception. My sheep know my voice. A stranger they will not follow. That is true. Not trying to say that... Billy Grimm's conversions is not right. I, I honor the brother and pray for him daily. God is using him. But did you know spirits, God takes his man but never his spirit? Do you know the devil takes his man but never his spirit? The spirit was up on Elisha, come on Elijah. And up from Elisha, come on John the Baptist. The Holy Spirit was on Christ, come down to the church. Just exactly. The spirit that was among those Pharisees in that day, the intellectuals, know all the training like Saul. But when they seen Jesus telling the people where they had been, what they had done, and who they were, they said he was a fortune teller, a Beelzebub. How many knows that to be true? Certainly. They believed in their intellectual faith. Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil. Now, but the real elected Jew, they said when the miracle was performed, like Nathaniel, he said, Thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. The little woman at the well to represent the Samaritan nation, she said what? Thou art the Messiah. Come and see this man. This is the Messiah. But the world said, Away with such a man. The world proved what they thought and what's in their heart. They'd do the same thing tonight if they could. When they preferred a murder in the sin of Jesus, it showed what the world was made out of. And the group that preferred the murder in the sin of the Lord Jesus was a religious group. The very finest of church, the Jewish Orthodox, the high priest, and all of them said, give us a murder and away with that God. That expressed the heart of the world. But all they can come to Christ. All will not believe, but there will be. Jesus said, These things that I do shall you also. Greater than this shall you do, because I go to my Father. A little while in the world won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, for I will be with you, even in you to the end of the world. How many knows that's true? Amen. How many knows of St. John 5, 19, that Jesus passed through the pool of Bethesda where all the people were laying, laying, blind, thousands of them, 
went to a man then on a pallet and healed him, for he knew that he had been that way and walked away and left that group laying there. How did he say, what did he say when they questioned him of it? What did he say? Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the Father doing. Is that right? It was my vision. Now, I want to say something to you. You've been here all week now, watch. Go back to your history, you historians, and look through the scriptures and seek them out and find out if Jesus performing those miracles by knowing their thoughts, telling them where they was, and so forth, when he said himself that he was God, he couldn't lie. That I don't do nothing till the Father shows me first what to do. And when he declared that sign before the true Jews, the real true Jews said that was the sign of the Son of God, the King of Israel. Is that right, Peter? When he did it to the Samaritans, they declared it was the sign of the Messiah. Is that right? But remember, he said, don't you go to any Gentile. And not one time did he ever do it before a Gentile. Why? This is the end of the Gentile age. That was the end of the Jews. This is the end of the Gentiles. No way through history since. But now is the hour. And America, you receiving your call. Mark it in your word, in your book, and find out. There's nothing left for America but judgment. They sin the way that they have brings. Exactly right. You believe me to be a servant, mark that down. Your servant, I yield myself to you with all that I've got. And I'll ask that this entire audience, Lord, I believe I can speak for us. We all will yield ourselves. Work through us now, Lord, to thy good pleasure. For we ask that in Jesus' name, and these people who are standing, Lord, they'll feel their real reward is good. Amen. I want the audience to be just quiet as you can. Just be seated, be reverent. With just these few prayer cards, I can run them through after a bit. About 50 prayer cards. We could even pick them up tomorrow night. If necessary. I've been getting to more than I thought, or maybe some of them couldn't get in. Now, if the Lord Jesus was standing here with this suit on that I have on, he gave it to me. And if he was standing here, Christ, the Son of the living God, which he is in glory, we know. But if he was standing here and you were sick, could he heal you? Be careful. No, sir. For he's already done it. How many know that? He was wounded for our transgressions. And you people just say, I said, when did you get saved? You say, five minutes ago. Oh, no, my dear brother, sister. You were saved 1,900 years ago. You just accepted your salvation. <laughs> See, that's your faith. You believe it. <laughs> that's the way it is now. Now, I'd like to say something. To those people here, it's got prayer cards. We'll get you maybe tomorrow or a little later. I just want people who does not have prayer cards. Uh, if the Lord Jesus will come and work through us and will perform the same thing that he did when he walked in Galilee, how many people in here will hold your hand and say, if he will do that, I'll, now look, you, don't, you won't be on the platform, but anywhere in the audience, and you be the judge. Every person in here is a total stranger to me besides this minister. And my co-worker right here, I think these are the ministers. Obviously, I may have met them somewhere, but I don't know what one sitting there. Here's Reverend Hall back here. I do know him. But how many in here know that I don't know nothing about you? Raise your hands. All in the building, anywhere. Now, if you're sick or you have need of anything, from the Lord Jesus, and if, and if you'll look to him and pray, now let's see what the scripture says in the book of Hebrews, it says, Jesus now is a high priest that can be touched 
with the feeling of our infirmities. How many knows the Bible says that? He is now. Does God keep all his words? He does. Then if you touched him, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, how would you know you touched him? He has to have to act in the same way he did yesterday to be the same today. Is that right? Amen. What did he do? He looked to the audience until he found that woman that had had the blood issue, and she had denied it. Oh, she was scared, but Jesus knew her and told her that her blood issue had stopped and she was well. Her faith had made her whole. That's true. Now, if he still lives today, he's the same God that stood there when they brought a man to him and he knew he was a righteous man and told him where he was before he comes to the meeting. That's the same God today. Don't you believe that? And if you do the same thing, how many of you, you in the chairs, now, if I said to this man sitting here, you're crippled, anybody can see that. Sure. But what about this man standing here? He looks stout and healthy. What's wrong with him? It wouldn't be no miracle if we said that man's crippled. Or that man's crippled. They're both here in wheelchairs. Or say maybe this woman's crippled, paralyzed, or whatever it is. You can see her laying there. Sure. That wouldn't be no miracle. But what about the woman sitting next to her here looks good and healthy? There's the miracle. Now, this, if I said, you're going to be well, every one of you, well, you just have to take my word for that. But now, what if he goes back and tells you the things that's in your life like he did the woman at the well, where her trouble was, then you know where that's right or not. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, I know he's real and true. I stood with the Koran in one hand. That's the Mohammed Bible, which exceeds us three times. And the Bible in another hand before 500,000 people and say one of them's right and the other is wrong. Let the God that is God speak. But don't you think they're all challenges? But I've never seen a time which doctors did everything for what our God overrode it and was crowned to stay there in holy shame. Just recently in Bombay, India, if you got, we're just about a half hour early. I just want to say this because I want to let out to these people. In Bombay, India, I just got in. They took me down to the Jan's Temple, and oh, they won't even kill a, a flea or a fly. They believe in reincarnation. And how could you preach to them a blood sacrifice? They made fun of Christianity. I'd have been a traitor to Christ if I had to spoke my peace. I said, how could you accept a blood sacrifice when you won't accept killing a flea or a man? Snakes and monkeys everywhere. They won't kill nothing. I said, but the antidote is the blood. For life is in the blood. Oh, they would believe that. That night when we were standing there, well, you, there's no way to estimate the number of people. Just as far as you could see was one great big black circle of people. Thousands times thousands power on each other. Just ripped like cardboard. There's no way to give out prayer cards. We just had to stop. And in a few moments, the militia had to bring two or three by, some lepers. The Holy Spirit began to speak to them and tell them. Just then somebody, you could feel it coming from those mystic men. Well, that could be a telepathy. The next come by was a blind man. I can do nothing, of course, till you see it done. Certainly. And this blind man, it says your name is, uh, I just had to spell it. That was right. And it says you're a beggar and your wife is a little thin woman. You have two children. They're both boys. Right. Exactly. And the mystic Hindus were sitting, watching out the world. God, will you do anything? I kept talking to the man for a few moments. After all, I saw a vision above him. He had been blind for 20 years. He worshipped the sun. Now, he thought if he watched the sun until he went blind, he'd go to heaven. He couldn't see sin no more, so he'd go to heaven. So he was a sun worshiper. And I said, you did this to ignorance. And I said, what about it? He said, the God that will give me my sight, let him be God. Hallelujah. I said, now, you Mohammedans, and you Jans and Sikhs and Buddhists that I was interviewed with this afternoon. Here is a man standing here that's totally blind. You said that Christianity 
was a bunch of people who was creating hydrogen bombs to blow one another up with. I said, a lot of that's truth, but that's not Christianity. I said, that's so-called Christianity. Real Christianity is the only true and living God that there is. Now, I said, this man said he would, he would serve the God to give him back his sight. He worshiped the creation and instead of the creator. I said, what would you Mohammeds do to him? you proselyte, make him a Mohammed. you Buddhist, will make him a Buddha. Sikhs will make him a... I said, it's nothing but psychology. Right? I said, in America, we do the same thing. All the Baptists wants to convert all the Methodists to being Baptists. The Pentecostal wants to make them all Pentecost. What is it? A change of thinking. Psychology. But I said, surely, the God who made him can heal him. Now, if any of you Buddhists can come forth on Mohammed and heal the man standing here, I'll serve your God. Would I have said that? Not at all, this first I saw a vision. Not at all. But I said, you can't do it. And neither can I. But the God of heaven has shown me a vision that the man's going to receive his sight. I said, if it doesn't happen, I'm a false prophet. You have a right to kick me out of India. If he does do it, you're obligated to the resurrection Christ to believe him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, that was a mighty quiet bunch. Hallelujah. But when we prayed for the man, this is on record, I took him in my arms and prayed for him and asked God to re- give him his sight while he was hooked against my bosom. When I turned him loose, God Almighty, my judge, before tens of thousands times thousands, that blind man's eyes was open, and he grabbed the mayor of the city and hugged him. That place went into a scream of the and tens of thousands of Mohammed came to the Lord Jesus. What was the matter? What I want over there? The Methodist bishop met me and said, you're coming out of the wrong denomination. We can't have nothing to do with it. What happened? They went right back out into Mohammedism, a lot of them, because the Christians conducting themselves like a bunch of puppets or kids. Yes. They wouldn't stay there to receive those people and take them and teach them the ways of the Lord. They'll be guilty of that in the day of the judgment. They're guilty, but God's grace is just the same. Did you know it always goes over the heads of people? Always down to the ages. You Catholic people who call St. Patrick your saint. He was about as much Catholic as I am. But you touch him. You didn't believe him first. But after he was dead, then you want to make him a saint. How about St. Francis of Assisi? The world didn't know he was a saint. He's a walking preacher with a Bible under his arm. That said to the birds, you keep still, little sisters, while I preach the gospel. You didn't believe him then, but after he was dead, then you made him a saint. Here, to you school children, how many remember Joan of Arc? She was a spiritual woman. She saw vision. And she was a spiritual woman. What did you do to her, the Catholic Church? Burn her at the stake as a witch. Of the Elzebub. The world has always done that. But after she is dead about a hundred years, you found out she was a saint, so you dug up those priest's body and threw them in the river to do repentance. God saw her, he saved it anyhow. Yes. Then after it's over, you say, Well, I didn't realize that. God, let's be merciful tonight. Let's believe with all of our hearts. Everybody. Now I'm asking you to be reverent and pray. I was just exactly on time now. I don't know if I call someone, I have no idea. It has to go by. How many see the picture of it? Let's see your hands. You're the angel of the Lord. Yes, sir. All through Germany and everywhere. Photograph the only supernatural being. Now, how many sick people see your most prayer? Raise your hands now. Everybody at the most prayer. I'll be real reverent. Look. If God will come and perform the same things that he did before he was crucified, 
which you have said you would believe in. Now let's pray just a moment. Now, Lord, help just now. The rest is yours, Father. We commit all things into thy hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, look this away. Now, what am I meaning by that? Peter and John said, look on us. When they raised up the brass serpent, they looked and lived. Now, don't look to me. Just look this away. But look to him who's the high priest. See what he would tell us. See what he would say. Each one's raised. And if God would do that, now by where that light leads, for the Holy Ghost, how many know that Jesus is the light? Let's see how many know that. Sure. He's on earth. He said, I come from God. I go to God. He was the pillar of fire that led the children to the wilderness. Do you believe that? Yeah. And when he returned back to God, Paul made him on the road to Damascus. A light put his eyes out. Peter was in prison. He come in as a light. Let him out. He's still the same. That's his picture. I'll be reverent. Let's just take it by sections, just so I won't get the whole mixed up. So many pulling right now. You people, a lot of you people have been in before, have faith to believe. Let's take this section in here. If somebody this way, just go to pray. Just to me. Now you see where I stand? I'm either here as a false witness of Christ. Or I'm a true witness of Christ. And if Christ don't back up what I've said and he said in his word, then we're both wrong. He is a Christ if he won't stay with his word. But he is Christ. And I could fail, but he can. He can't fail. My word is a man. But I'm quoting his word. The things that I do shall you all go. Just, I've been turned around. See, I was going to have a, I stay in the room from about 3 o'clock on praying and fasting and waiting on the Lord when I come into these meetings. I'm bleeding this tonight because you're such a bleeding group. That's all. And remember, I don't want your prayer cards. Anyone with prayer cards? Just be reverent. Just imagine him walking in among the people. The Pharisees in their hearts said he's the elder above. They didn't say it out loud, but he knew what they were saying. Just have faith now, believe. Be just reverent. Mothers with your little children, whatever more, just be reverent. I can't heal you, but if he'll prove that he's here, he's already done it. His word. <coughs> Out the audience can hear me. Look here. Look right here. This light here. Or this little lady right here. If you have a prayer card, lady, little lady right here, you don't have a prayer card. <laughs> Do we know each other? We don't. I've never seen you in my life. God knows you. He knows me. If he will reveal to me what you're here for, you'll know whether it's the truth or not. And if I don't know you and never seen you and you never know me or never seen me, then it would have to come through supernatural power, wouldn't it? What am I doing now? I'm talking to you to find out what the Holy Spirit wants to tell you. You were just sitting there praying, Lord, let it be me. If God would tell me what's your trouble, would you believe me to be his prophet, his servant? You're suffering with a nervous condition. If that's right, stand up on your feet. Is this our first time meeting? You've never seen me before. Just raise your hand so the people can see. This is our first time. Do you believe that what you well, know what your trouble was? Do you believe that to be the same God that knows what the woman's trouble was at the well? You do? Does the audience believe the same thing? Thank you. Just that you might know. This young woman's got something else on her heart. Isn't that right, young lady? If it is, wave your hand so that people can see it. 
If God will reveal to me what's on your heart, will you make you stronger to believe? It's about some of your people, your in-laws. That's your husband's uncle. He has cancer. And your husband also has someone else that he's been praying over you to. And that's his cousin. And they have epilepsy. That does say it's the Do you believe, young lady? Whatever you've asked, go and have it just the way you believe. Do you believe all of you? Now, after you have seen, do you believe? Amen. What do you think, sir, sitting there next to her? You. Are you a stranger to me? Do you have a prayer card? You don't. Do you believe me to be his servant? If the God of heaven will reveal to me what your trouble is, you'll know what's the truth or not, won't you? Will you believe and accept it with all your heart? If you believe that, that diabetes would leave you. That's what you do. Or you go home and be well. In the name of Jesus. Do you really believe? What about back in this section? Do you all believe? All right, just be reverent. Here it is. Can of course you can see it. Unless God would choose to show you. See that line hanging right there? It's right over this lady at that coat on sitting right there, that little striped thing in her mind. The red coat on. You. That's you. Stand to your feet. Have you a prayer card? You don't. Do you know me? I don't know you. If that's true, let's just hold our hands up so that people can see. If the Lord our God, Jesus Christ, has raised the dead, and you just a woman walked in here and sat down, we've never met in life. If Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and wants to make known to these people that he's still the Messiah resurrected, he would do it in the same way he did to the Samaritan race. The woman at the well. What do you do it? I don't know your troubles, you know, if I don't know you. But if Jesus will reveal to me what your troubles is, will you believe it's just like the woman said, come see a man who told me the things of the You're suffering, and your trouble is in your throat, also in your heart, and in your back. That's right. Sit down on your heels. Do you believe with all your heart? Just be reverent. Everyone, just believe with all your heart. Have faith, don't doubt. I don't believe we've been in this section yet. Let's see, some in here pray. Here. Here's a lady sitting right here down here. She has a roaring in her head. That's the lady sitting right there. Stand up on your feet. Now. Have you a prayer card? You know. Am I a stranger to you? Your father was a roaring, upsetting your head. Now to heal you, I couldn't. Christ has done it. But to hide your life, you couldn't. Let me say this to you. There's somebody in this building right now that's connected with you, that's afraid, that's your mother. And that woman is dying with a cancer. If I tell you where that cancer is, will it help your faith? It's cancer of the stomach. 
That's exactly right. Now go home and let me be well. Do you believe? Have faith. Just believe. Tone down. Have faith now. Just believe everything. Don't doubt a thing. If thou canst believe. Here. Right here in front of me. Lady. Just fell and hurt your back. Do you believe Jesus Christ make you well? If you will do. You may have what you ask for. If you if you can believe. Lady sitting right here. Suffering with a nervous condition. The little lady with blue head on. If you believe with all your heart. That's right. Get thou against the deep. What about the lady sitting right here on the end of the road, right back behind this gentleman fanning the baby? You had more faith than you thought you had. You believe that hurry will be healed? You do? Wave your hand to God if you think it'll be healed. Have you a prayer card? You don't. You don't need any. Do you believe? I believe we've been over the... Let's hear about preachers. My brethren, you're not immune from the blessings of God because you're shepherds. How many of you men know that I don't know you? Raise your hand, you preacher. All right. Encourage your faith to believe. Just be praying. If you got anything wrong with you, you want God to heal. Sir, you're sitting right here. <laughs> Drop your head down because you know something happened to you. I don't know you. We're strangers right there. You have heart trouble. That's right. You believe God is Indian? You're not from this country. You're from Pennsylvania. Your name is Mr. Reverend. Do you pronounce that holy or is it? Go home and pledge you. Go ahead and preach the God. Do you believe? All of you believe? Now, as is Jesus Christ alive? If he is, raise your hand. Sure he's alive. Now, if you will do what I asked you to do, don't doubt. Just believe this, each one out. Lay your hands over on one another. Everybody in the building. Just put your hands on each other. I'm going to quote to you the last message Jesus said. Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Now how many of you will put your hands on the person and raise your hands up and say, God, I am a believer. Everyone. Now believe this is your hour, this is your time. You people in a wheelchair, now you really leave you on the cross. You have policy, not a denial. I cannot hear you, but if you believe, you can't hide your life, God will make you well. You can rise up and go home and be well. Now put your hands over on your person again, each one, not a cross on your hands. Now let's conduct ourselves like great believers. The Holy Ghost is your friend. You're just sitting out around the aisle. If you have a need of anything, you're young, 